Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today for our Solid Food Bible Study. And uh, it's a, uh, a Monday. We're recording this on a Monday to be played on Tuesday morning. And uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of being able to speak in church. And I want to tell you, uh, speaking to an empty auditorium that is pretty dark and having no people there is even a lot different than sitting here at the desk and looking into a camera. Now, I don't mind this so much, but I'll tell you, I did not enjoy uh, the environment of uh, an empty auditorium with just a few people there. Uh, that was very difficult for me. I'm glad that very soon, and you're going to hear in, a, in the very near future about uh, our uh, being able to start our services again and things like that. You'll be hearing about that very soon. And so uh, I'm glad we're going to be able to do that. I would not want to preach in an environment like uh, we had yesterday here. Uh, there were just like maybe 10 or 12 people uh, out in the congregation. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the jokes that I told got no response because there were not that many people here to respond to them. And so it was just a completely different experience for me. So I'm glad that we can keep going uh, with the uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube for our Solid Food Bible Study and at the same time get back to uh, church uh, once again very soon. Well, we're in the book of Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament. And uh, we started last week by looking at some very uh, interesting and uh, outstanding verses that the prophet Malachi wrote uh, some 400 years before uh, the time that Jesus Christ came into the world. Remember, he, along with several other minor prophets, uh, was sent by God to encourage and to instruct the people who had come back from the 70-year captivity to begin again rebuilding the temple and the wall around the city of Jerusalem. And we looked at some of these verses last week. I hope you have your Bible there open to the book of Malachi. Uh, we started last week by looking at those verses that predict John the Baptist coming. Very interesting. The Old Testament ends with a prophecy concerning John the Baptist, and the New Testament begins some 400 years later with the appearance of John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and also the picture of Elijah, who was predicted to come before the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus said there would be one coming who dressed like Elijah, who preached like Elijah, and he would be the fulfillment of the first coming of the Messiah. And then we saw over in chapter 4 of Malachi, verses 4 and 5, that Elijah truly would come again. And we see him in Revelation chapter 11, along with Moses. And so we looked at those prophecies. Uh, we looked up in chapter 3 of Malachi in verse 6, and we saw there the immutability of the Lord, I am uh, the Lord, I change not. His unchangeableness being one of the characteristics of God. Then we looked at the passage in chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, concerning tithing. The fact that the tithe that we give, the, the base for New Testament people as to their giving to the Lord, as it was in the Old Testament, the tithe was what was expected so in the New Testament, we find that everything that the Old Testament law spoke of was increased in our time of grace that we live. So the tithe becomes our basis, and then we add to that the offerings that we give to the Lord. And uh, we saw last week that the Bible says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. If we gave that a New, uh, a new Testament interpretation, we would say that means bring the tithe into the church. In other words, the church deserves the tithe of the people of that congregation. You want to support something else? That's wonderful, but that's through our offerings. And uh, as, as the Bible said, uh, bring the tithes into the storehouse 
that there may be meat in my house. In other words, that the needs might be provided. Best illustration I ever heard about that uh, was the illustration where the fellow said, uh, if I go out to eat at, at Bob Evans, I don't go over to Olive Garden to pay the bill. In other words, I've eaten at Bob Evans, uh, I've enjoyed what I've had there, so I pay the bill there. And, and the same thing for us. Uh, we go to a particular church, uh, that church meets our needs, we're fed there from the Word of God, uh, we are ministered to when we're in the hospital, we have our counseling and everything else through that local church, and so that's where our provision is made with the tithe. And then we support other organizations and other ministries through our offering. Then, just at the end, last week, uh, we looked at verse 16 uh, of chapter 3 of Malachi. Great verse. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard. Isn't that interesting? God hears what we have to say. I think one of the most precious things about our prayer life is that not only does God hear what we say to him, what we ask of him, but the Bible tells us he has all the resources in heaven to meet our need. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so the Bible says here, God hears us. And the Bible says, God hearkens unto us. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Interesting question. Does God keep records? The answer is yes. The Bible tells us right here that God had a book of remembrance, but you say, that's Old Testament. Does that happen in the New Testament also? Yes, if you look in Revelation chapter 19, you will see that when the unbelieving dead appear before the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the judge, the Bible says the books are opened. And another book is open, which is the book of life, and the unbelieving dead are showed that their name was never recorded. They never accepted Jesus as their Savior. And then the Bible says they are judged out of the things written in the books according to their works. And so God does keep a record. I'm glad that the Bible says for you and me who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the Bible says the book of our sinful works has been destroyed. The Bible says he has removed our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. He has buried our sins in the depths of the deepest sea to be remembered against us no more. But how about the things that we do for the Lord after we get saved? Yeah, the Bible says this. I'm going to look over here in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 3. If you'd like to look there with me, uh, feel free to do so. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the fact that there is a record kept concerning our works that we do for the Lord after the time that we are saved. The Bible says in uh, verse number 12, now, if any man build upon this foundation, what foundation? Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, we know him as our Savior. He's now the foundation of our lives. Matthew chapter 7 speaks of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And there Jesus is saying uh, that we need to build our lives upon the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, to have the solid rock, Jesus Christ, as the foundation of our life. Now the Bible says, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. The word manifest means evident. Every man's work shall be made evident. 
For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, if your work as a Christian uh, abide uh, that we have built thereon, the Bible says he shall receive a reward. And so God keeps records of what we do. The Bible says we will be rewarded one day when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And so here in verse 16 of Malachi chapter 3, we read uh, of the reward that is ours for our service for the Lord Jesus. But look at verse 17. Here's another great verse. The Bible says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Did you ever sing that song as a young person in Sunday school? I mean, that's a lot of years ago when we used to sing this song. I haven't heard it for a long time. Uh, the song kind of goes, When he cometh, when he cometh, to make up his jewels, precious jewels, uh, his loved and his own. Like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems in his crown. And so the Bible says, when Jesus comes to make up his jewels, uh, we'll be able to shine along with him. An Old Testament prophecy, but a New Testament fulfillment that tells us that God keeps records and God will uh, reward. Now, a second thing we want to do here in the book of Malachi is we want to look at an outline of the book. There are many great verses uh, that uh, have an implication in the New Testament, uh, but also there is an outline for this book. Uh, the outline for the book kind of goes like this. In the first chapter, the first five verses have to do with God's love for Israel. In other words, God says, I have loved you. And he explains to them, and we're going to see that in just a little bit, he explains to them what that love is all about. And then when we come to chapter 1, verse 6, and we go all the way down through chapter 2 and verse 9, we find God's indictment against the Old Testament priest, who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of, of God's people, Israel, but they had failed greatly. And then when we come to chapter 2, verse 10, and we go all the way through chapter 3 and verse 18, we find about the iniquity or the sins of the people of God in reference to the Lord. Remember I told you there were eight questions that Israel, the people, ask of God kind of looking up at God and saying, God, do you know what you're saying? Do you know what you're really implying by what you say to us? And they question God. And God implies to them that you are dis disrespectful, you are disobedient, and you are rebelling against me. And then we come to chapter 4. And when we come to chapter 4, there are but five, or I'm sorry, six verses here. And they speak to us about the coming day of the Lord and the judgment that will come in that day. Verse 1 says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And that day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And so here uh, we find uh, the coming day of the Lord. Look at verse 2. That's a, we kind of missed that one, but that's another important verse. Bible says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, notice the word Son is S-U-N, not S-O-N, speaking of the brightness of the righteousness and glory of God, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Healing in his wings. Speaking of the power of the Lord, not only of, uh, of the spiritual things of our life, but also of the physical things of our lives also. 
Further describing that day of the Lord, he says in verse 3, And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet in that day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. And so the Lord who came the first time prophesied and, and pointed to by John the Baptist, who came as the meek and lowly Savior, who came as the compassionate uh, Lord delivering to us uh, who God is, and telling us about his salvation, will come a second time. And when he comes, he'll come as the sovereign monarch. He'll come as the ruler over all the earth, and he'll come as the God of judgment. And so that's the outline of the book. God looks at the people and he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, but I have been forsaken, first by the priests who were to be the spiritual leaders, and then by the people. And finally, he says, one day I am coming again in judgment upon all those who have rebelled. And so now we've looked at two out of the three main parts of the book of Malachi. We've seen the outstanding verses, and we have seen the outline of the book. Now we want to take a few moments to look at these eight questions that the people of God ask of God. Notice in chapter 1, question number 1, God says in verse 2, I have loved you saith the Lord. And the question of the people is, yet we say, or you say, wherein have you loved us? In other words, having experienced all that God has done for them and, and uh, realizing the love that God has for them, they still question the fact that God really loves them. And God answers back, and he says, uh, was not Esau Jacob's brother? saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. And so he says here, I put my approval upon the line of Jacob. Esau, the other brother, the Bible says uh, here, Esau have I hated, but it's not in the manner that we would look as hate toward a person. He is saying, Esau, I rejected. A and his descendants have not experienced the blessing of God like Jacob's descendants have. I have loved you, and I approved of the family of Jacob, and have followed that line all the way down through, expressing my love to you. And so the first question, they said, wherein have you loved us? Almost like questioning the love of God. I'm glad we don't have to do that today. I'm glad we can say we have a love that has been granted to us by the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, an everlasting love a love whereby he says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and we can count on it for sure. Those verses that Jesus tells us that when we come to him, he will in no wise cast us out. And I'm so glad we can begin this Christian life with the love of God assured to us, and we can continue on in this Christian life day after day, building toward that goal that he has set before us and that purpose that he has for us. Not continually uh, sinning and have to go back to the beginning and start all over again, but having the wonderful ability to come before our, our advocate, our lawyer, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask him to forgive us for our sins and we continue on in that Christian life. The second question down in verse 6, uh, God says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, priest, that despise my name. And the priest look back at him, and they say, Wherein have we despised your name? Wherein have we held you in contempt? And verse 7, God says, the third question, You have offered polluted bread upon mine altar, 
And you say, wherein have we polluted you? Wherein have we failed to respect you? And wherein have we polluted the altar of God? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, that we have no respect for the sacred things of God. Here's God's answer. In other words, God told the people, when you come to sacrifice, always bring that animal that has no blemish in it. Because the animals of the Old Testament sacrifice were a picture of who Jesus Christ be, would be when he came into the world. And uh, First Peter describes that for us. Remember the Bible says, For you were not redeemed with silver and gold from the vain conversation, from the corruptible lifestyle that you received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so the Old Testament animals were to be perfect. They were to be observed. And any imperfection, that disqualified that animal from being a sacrifice. And God says, now I'm going to show you where you have polluted, disrespected, and found my name contemptible. Notice verse 8. He said, you offer the blind for sacrifice. Is that not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? He says this. He says, in comparison, offer it now unto your governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord? In other words, God says, if you'd offer something like you offer to me, to a political official, he would be offended. Should not I be offended? This is how they had disrespected the name of the Lord. Look at verse 10. He said, who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. He said, would there be someone who would just go and close the door to the temple? Would there be someone who would say, I'm not going to offer any more sacrifices because what we're doing is wrong in the sight of God? Look at verse 13. He said here, behold, what a weariness it is. That's what the people said. Uh, we're just getting tired of doing this. And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this at your hand, saith the Lord. But he says in verse 14, But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. There's where the priest had failed. He said, Am I not a king, saith the Lord of hosts? And my name is dreadful among the heathen. And so the priest had greatly failed the Lord. Notice verse 8 of chapter 2. He says, But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. And so he said, I've rejected you. I've made you to look foolish in the eyes of the people. Oh, what a terrible thing it is. If you have been called of God to serve him, to proclaim his word, to minister his grace to people, and yet you have failed in that sacred responsibility. I believe there's a special judgment for those who have failed, having been called by God to do what he has for them to do, and yet they have disobeyed, they have disrespected, and they have not carried out that sacred responsibility before the Lord. And so here we have that uh, second and third question that the people brought before God. Notice one other one here over in chapter 2 and verse 14. 
we're into the section now, the third section, where we see the disobedience of the people of God against the Lord. Notice he says in verse 10, Have we not all one Father? Hath not, uh, hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously, every man against his brother, by profaning the covenant of our fathers? And he speaks here of the contention, the strife that was between Israel and Judah. And, and the fact, he says in verse 11, Judah hath dealt treacherously. And, and he's comparing this relationship later on down here to the relationship between a husband and his wife. The people ask, why doesn't God accept our sacrifices? That's what verse 14 is all about. Here they say, yet you say, wherefore? In other words, God, why don't you accept the sacrifices that we bring? And God answers. He says, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant? And did he uh, not make one? Yet he had the residue of the Spirit, wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none of you deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord God, the God of Israel, you heard this one before? The God of Israel saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. So he speaks here of the putting away, the divorce that was present within the nation of Israel at that time, interfering and interrupting with their spiritual sacrifice with God. And, and so we have here in Malachi these questions of the people. You would think a remnant that was coming back from Babylon, coming back to do the sacred work of reconstructing the temple, reconstructing the wall around the city of Jerusalem, would be a people that would be holy, set apart totally to God, but they weren't. We've seen in the other minor prophets that God had an indictment against them. And here we find the same also. The priests were rebelling. The people led by the priests were following in their footsteps, and they were not following uh, obediently in the ways of the Lord. And so they begin questioning God. They begin disrespecting God. They begin polluting the sacrifices of God. They begin disobeying in their lives, day by day, in their relationships uh, between husband and wives. And God says uh, to come back to him. Notice, he says, over in verse 7 of chapter 3, he says, Even from the days of your fathers you were gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, God says, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Do you know what that means? That means the people looked at God and said, God, we have become so uh, hardened to the things of the Lord that we don't even see what you're talking about. We don't even believe we have gone away from you. We have become so hardened that when you tell us to return to you, we look at you and we say, what do you mean return? We haven't gone anywhere. That's why you and I in our Christian life today should never become unduly familiar with the things of God. The things of God, his person, his word, his commandments, his call to serve him, should never become ordinary. We should always put them in a special place, a sacred place in our lives. I remember when I was at school down at Bob Jones, and every day we would recite the university creed. 
It was really a doctrinal statement of what we believed. And every day we'd go over it. But you know, when every day you come into chapel and every day you repeat that creed, it sometimes becomes ordinary. Sometimes you have your mind on something else. Sometimes it's just another day of repeating it and it becomes ordinary. I remember one time I got a pair of binoculars. I wanted those binoculars so much that when I got them for Christmas, man, I went and looked. Everybody in the neighborhood probably thought I was a peeping Tom, but I would look all over the neighborhood, not into windows, but just everywhere to see what I could see. I would take them to ball games, and oh, that was exciting to see what was there before me. But I'll tell you what, after a while, they became ordinary, and I kind of didn't use them very much anymore, and I, I put them uh, pretty much on a shelf. That's what we do sometimes with the things of God. That's what these people had done. They had come to the place where the things of God were so ordinary that they no longer respected what God said. They no longer examined the animals. They no longer considered their vows in life sacred. They no longer honored God for who he was. May we never come to that place. May we realize the sacredness of our God, the sacredness of his calling to our life, and the sacredness of his word to direct our paths every day. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We've got a few more questions to look at, and we'll conclude this study of the Old Testament minor prophets again next week. I consider it a privilege to be able to come before you today and to just share with you the Word of God. And even in these Old Testament scriptures written 400 years before Jesus came, we can find some exhortation, some instruction, and some leadership for our lives today. Let's hold our God in a sacred place in our life and truly treasure His love, His Word, and the opportunity to serve him day by day. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again next week.